Uh, thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to see all of you here online and off on site. We're delighted to have Professor Michael Herzog with us. Uh, Michael is full professor and head of the Psychophysics Laboratory here at EPFL. His talk is entitled, Do We Really, Me really Measure What We Believe We Are Measuring? The talk will last for approximately 40 to 45 minutes. We will have them ample of time for questions. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to put them in the chat and we we'll try to take them up later on during this Q&A session. Mikael, thank you so much for your availability today. Thank you to the whole and to the whole uh, CS team who makes these events happen. Um, Mikael, let's close uh, all yours. Okay, please. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, before I really start uh, talking about, uh, about talking about the measuring part, I just want to give you a quick overview of what we're really doing in the lab because what I'm presenting today is a little bit a side project. So what we usually do is uh, visual information processing in humans. The bulk of the subjects we're measuring are healthy humans, but we have also psychiatric patients. We will some of these results a little bit later on, older people, children. At least then we use all type of techniques you use in these days if you do human research. So main stuff is psychophysics, but we also do TMS, EG, and fMRI. And the main bulk of our study is just finding out how the human visual system processes information. And this can be interesting also for computer vision people. And I just want to show you one project, the uh, one representative project in this respect. And then I go to the more applied stuff, which I think is, could be quite interesting for data analysis and mathematicians. Okay, <clears throat> so here you see a normal street scene, you see a bike and you potentially see the reflector here on the two wheels and your task is to think about what is the orbit of this reflector? And you can trace this out with your hand if you want. And potentially you have traced out something like this. Yeah, it's like an orbit in some way. Yeah, is that what you're seeing, what you saw? But that's of course not true. Um, this is what you perceive, but it's not what the real motion in the world or what the motion of um, the receptor is, uh, the reflector is on your retina. It's one of these four. Which one do you choose? Okay, I have only you two, so. <laughs> A, the C, okay, that's a common one. Jan? Uh, D. D, actually D is correct. So it, first of all, it's not circular at all. It's not an orbit. And you can basically appreciate this here. And what you see is here, you see the reflector and you see the trajectory the reflector traces out. That's how it looks in the external world if there is no eye movement. But that's not what we perceive. What we perceive, is an orbit is basically something circular. And that simply happens because you're subtracting the horizontal motion of the bike from the true retinal or the true external world trajectory. And that means we usually perceive the motion of a part of a thing relative to the thing. So in this case, we perceive the motion of the reflector relative to the bike. We don't perceive it, it really is. But on the retina, what we have is indeed this, how it's called, the quotate cyclery. This is basically this number D type of motion. So in some way, the brain needs to transform this retinotopic information in a non-retinotopic object-based um, reference frame. And how this works, of course, we don't investigate with bikes. Usually we have our own stimuli that are very well controllable. Here's one animation. And you see potentially two black disks flickering, right? And on top of this, there are two white dots. On the left, it goes up, down. And on the right, it goes left, left, right. Yeah. Do you see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just adding another disk to the left and right. And there's a center dot in it. And potentially now the percept should have changed for you drastically. What you should see right now, or what most participants report to see, is that there are three disks. They go back and forth in concert, in tandem. And in the middle, you see a white dot and that spins in the clockwise direction. Do you perceive this? Mm -hmm. And in the outer dot, you see two white dots stationary in the center. Mm -hmm. Right? But actually, in fact, I haven't changed too much. So here's the stimulus layout. You can see in the center of the display is exactly the same. So here in this um, demonstration, you see up, middle, down. This is just what I showed you before. And here, middle, right, middle, left, so that's the left, right motion. We get exactly the same thing um, in the left display. 
we just added these little um, contextual disks, one to the left, one to the right, left and right. And they changed the reference frame. So here you integrate it in a retinotopic reference frame. You just integrate it from um, along this motion, uh, along the, uh, you integrate it at this point in the visual field. Yeah, time is here. You integrate it at the disk here too. Now what's going on to happen is you're basically integrating this with this. That's like the bike motion. And you see a static disk in the center, same here. But the interesting part happens here. So you're not integrating up, middle, down. You're integrating up, right, down, left. And for this reason, even on the retina, the entire information is the same. And in the external world too. You have completely changed the reference frame and that's for this reason, now you're going to perceive a circular motion. So with this display, we are now, this is just a psychophysical demonstration. With this type of displays, we are now able to go ahead and investigate what's going on in the brain, how these transformations happen. And you know what we do is usually we take fMRI and we see where in the brain it happens. Then we take EEG and we look when it happens. Then we look at the eye movements, which in this respect, there should be no eye movement. And at the end, we come up with a model. So that's basically one of our typical bread and butter jobs where we have one visual problem, how to integrate information non-retinotopically and then we go ahead with all the tools and batteries we have to, to uh, nail down what's going on. If you have some ideas how to do this mathematically, we would be very happy. But this is all, only a side project and I just wanna show what we usually do. We do also some applied research here in schizophrenia patients, aging and individual differences. And that's, that's a project I wanna, one of these projects I want to show you because we found at least what we believe quite some puzzling results for which we have absolutely no explanation. Okay, it is in some way about common factors and what is a common factor? So if you wanna get a driver license in Switzerland and most other countries on this planet, you need first to pass an eye test. And if you don't pass the eye test, you're not going to run your, your, your car. And what eye doctors usually do is they present say some ease and you need to save the ease, whatever, to the right or left or something like this. And as said, if you're good, you will pass the test. An implicit assumption about this is that um, if you test it with another test, with another eye test doctors use, and here you need to say if the gap is to the left, up, right, or something like this, that the test results in some way should correlate with each other because you don't wanna basically have a test that basically just measure, measures what the test measures. You wanna basically measure the underlying latent variable, which is good vision, good everyday vision, not being good with ease or with rings or something like this. It should be representative for what you think is crucial, something that enables you to drive a car. So that's a common factor. Um, and in some way that seems to make sense because there are people with good and bad vision. And the idea is that these eye tests pick up these differences and so they are representative for it. Um, another common factor is for example, lifestyle. Do you smoke? Why not? <laughs> it makes you die. It makes you die, okay? So it's unhealthy in some way. But what, what do you mean with it's unhealthy? Uh, smells bad. Smells bad, okay. That's something that. you heard your whole life. Don't smoke. Don't smoke, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all agree in. But, but what means health in some way? Uh, is it skin health, brain health, heart? What is it? It's all of it, right? It's all of it, so you're believing in a common factor. That's exactly the idea. You believe there is something that basically influences the system in a very general common factor common factor type of fashion. Here's the last one. That's a classic one, what people do in our field to test how good the visual system is. You have one of these patches here, it's called a Gabor patch, and you can lower the contrast and people need to say whether or not it's on present on screen. And on the right, you see the results. So contrast is here. Forget the, just look at the one cycle per decreasing. In red, we have the uh, older participants and in blue, we have the young participants and a high value means bad performance. So you can see that uh, uh, all the participants are much worse than the young participants. Yeah, they have higher values. You need more contrast to see whether or not the patch is there. Um, so this is a huge difference. And in some way you would say, yeah, that reflects in some way what's going on when you get older. So it's representative for the visual decline when people age. And then people spend 
maybe not their entire life, but quite some part of their career and finding out what are the age-related factors. So they do, for example, animal models, they do computer simulations. And the idea is to pinpoint where in the visual systems, visual system, the um, decaying aspects are. And then the idea is, for example, to counteract it. The classic idea here is, again, a common factor idea, which says, oh, yeah, there is something behind vision. And we can basically detect it with this type of task, with this type of contra contrast detection task. That's the idea. So it's another common factor. And the idea is, if you investigate it with these Gabor patches or with other type of stimuli, it shouldn't matter because they're all representative for visual decline. That's the idea. So in general, each sign has its tests and they are supposed to be representative for the field. And doing in-depth research basically will reveal what's going on. For example, some molecules or GABA or whatever. Okay, so we looked into this and what we did first is more or less the same what other people have done too. We looked into a couple of visual tests and we had also good reason to believe that when you get older, we all know this when you get older, vision de declines, it starts from age 30 on usually. And there are good reasons why it happens because, you know, on the optical level, lens clouding, retina, all, they're all changes that make vision bad. On the visual or on the cortical level, you know that uh, neurotransmitter combination change, neurons die, all these type of things. In general, we get slower when you get older. So in some way, there is a good reason to believe that there is a common factor. Okay, so what, what we had is basically we looked into uh, a sample of 200 subjects with 130 old people and 108 young people. And what we did first is we applied a couple of these tests, tests that are believed to be representative for the visual system. So we had this Gabor test I showed you before. We have the visual acuity doctors use I showed you before, and a couple of other things like something about motion, something about temporal processing, another more complicated motion processing, something with orientation, I don't know if you can see, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really matter. It's not about vision here. It's actually at the end about statistics. And what we, oh, and then we had a couple of other tests too. We can skip this. And these are the first results. So what we plotting here is the performance for the young people, um, why, and for the old people. And this is our eye test we had before. And you can see there's huge differences. You know, the older people are much worse than the younger ones. And you can see this here too. They're much, much worse than the younger ones. You can look at these p-values. They are fantastic in some way. You would say, oh, this is super results. And you might open a bottle of champagne. But it just means when you get older, your vision gets worse. OK, there's nothing new here. That's what was shown by other researchers before. Everyone found that when you apply such type of visual test, the performance actually deteriorates. Okay. The only new thing here is that we uh, tested all these tests with the same observers. And we can now basically compare this. So what we expected, oh, what you can see here too is maybe I should mention this, is that the standard deviation or the standard error actually for the older people is much, hard, uh, much larger than for the young ones. So actually some of the old people perform as good as the young ones whereas others are really way off. And so we expected that someone, I think that's a very natural thing, but we just talked about it, about the lens clouding and blah, blah, blah. What we have shown is um, that there are some good reasons to believe why certain people have better vision than others. And so we expected that if someone is very good in a task like this, this person should be very good in this task like this too. So what we did is we just did some simple correlations here you see the different type of tasks. Um, this, for example, the FRAC, this is the visual acuity test. And you see the pairwise correlations, forgot the lower triangle here. And this is for the young participants. And in the color, the saturation of the color tells you how large these correlations are. And what you can see is this is mainly pale colors. And you can look at these values. I don't know if you can see this. They're usually quite close to zero. That means they don't correlate with each other. So we expected that someone who is super good in one test should be super good in another test that should basically be reflected in a correlation. But we don't find these correlations. There's, there's a few ones here. There's one with 0.91. That's a super high correlation, but it's a test retest. Basically, the same test again. So in some way, it's not that the subjects are just noisy or whatever. No, 
if you test the same stuff again, usually you find quite good performance. But just look at the acuity test, yeah? That's what doctors measure. Measure, for example, whether or not you get a driver license. Uh, you see, they're all not correlated. That means each of the tests picks up something independent. Okay, that was the young participants. We were a little bit surprised. We had some quantitative measure. It means most of the pairwise correlation have a R square smaller than O dot one, which is considered to be a small or negligible effect. Yeah. Okay, good. So we thought, okay, this need to change when we look at the older participants, because here some of the participants have bad eyes. They should, and that should be reflected in large correlation. Yeah, but actually what we found is just the opposite. So no, almost all colors are completely pale. And if you look at the values, except for a few ones, you can see they are always super close to zero. So it means none of the tests picks up the same as another test. They're fully uncorrelated to each other. So it's not that these tests measure something general about the visual system, they just measure something different. So the big question is, and that's what we are, what puzzles us, we don't know exactly what it means. We can just rule out a common factor, that's for sure. But we don't, don't know what the underlying problem is. Maybe it's just, I come to this a little bit later. Okay, th th that's the puzzling results we have. And I think this is the main issue right now and we are looking for help that people can tell us what's going on there. But okay, here's just the quantification again. So out of the 190 pairwise correlations, only 15 are worth to talk about it. And from these 15, I think eight are test three tests. So there's only seven correlations, something like this, that basically tell us that these tests measure something in common. Yeah, so in some way, when we get older, we get actually more individual, not less. Contrary to what we have expected from lens clouding, less uh, neurons and so on and so forth. Okay, of course, you don't wanna only look at correlations, you wanna look at multivariate statistics, so we did PCAs and all types of factor analysis, and the result is more or less the same. So there is not something hidden here. There's no hidden structure when we use linear methods. I will come back to this a little bit later. Okay, but that sounds weird. You know, we all know that there are people with better vision than others, isn't it? For example, I have really bad vision. So how can it be? So we did something wrong, that was our idea. So what we did is a, we computed a rank analysis. And so what we did is we had all, the, all our tasks, say here the contrast sensitivity task. And if you had been say, the best observer, you get a one. If you're the last, you get 200 because we had 200 observers. If you're in the middle, you get 100. Yeah? We just go the rank, how good you are, one, two, three, five to 200. Okay, we do this in the next task, you get another rank and so on and so forth. So for each task, you get a rank and then we average the ranks. So it tells you how good you are on average in these tasks. And here's performance, it's already uh, sorted by performance. This is the mean rank. So if there is an observer or, or participant who is always number one, then this value would be one. But of course, that's never going to happen. And if you are really the worst subject, you always have 200. So what you can see right now is, um, in the blue, we have the young ones, and in red, we have the older ones. You can see the younger ones are much better than the older ones. And what you can see, and I think what the most important thing here is that the range is really huge. So it goes from almost 40 or 50 to 140, almost 100 ranks. So yeah, there are people who are much better than others. Some are really super good and some are really super bad. And these super bad ones are usually more the older ones. So there seems to be an obvious contradiction. And what we did is we said, okay, let's compare it with a null model. A null model. So we run some computer simulations and basically assigned ranks virtually randomly to observers. And that you can see in this triangle here. And you see the triangle is perfectly on top of the other curve. That means, yes, there are super good participants, but these super good participants are not good because they have good vision. Or they, yeah, it's not because they are just good in general. They're just the lucky winners of a lottery where for each test, they basically good. So it's not that they're good in general. It's not like the Mozart gene or something like this, or the vision, the good vision thing. 
But they is they got good in motion detection, they got good in Gabor detection, they got good in this one. For each little thing, they got just the lucky winners. So there is no common factor. It just comes by accident being the happy winners in a lottery that is played for each test individually. So that means we are super individual simply because, um, because there are so many factors behind this. That's at least what we believe. Maybe this is wrong. It's a question for the theoreticians. And so on. But that's the puzzling part uh, we have here. OK. <clears throat> Is that clear in some way? So in, in, in some way, I believe this is in general too. If you, whatever, a genius or something like this is not because there is this genius gene. I think you're just happy with this hundred of things that make you the person that is best suited to do certain type of things. And potentially this comes by the one million SNPs we have on the DNA, which basically make us differently. Maybe this is just a fallout of this. And the idea is maybe we don't look like each other, you know, you don't like look like me. Why do you believe that perception is the same? Maybe it differs as much as our physio physiognomy, physiognomy. Okay, good. Okay. May I ask a question? Uh, yeah. From... yeah? Uh, it's super interesting. Just uh, one question. You showed these uh, random ranking. Is yeah. it the same for uh, old and young people separately? No, no, that was, that was, they were, were all put in one pot here. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's why you see that the red point, the older people are, uh, have the higher ranks, the higher average ranks, mean ranks. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I was wondering if you do it separately, then uh, is it possible to see separation from the random sampling or not? I don't think so. We can test, we haven't tested it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Let's go ahead a little bit. Okay, null results, you might say maybe this whole zero low correlations just come because we have test free test reliability. That's not true. We looked at a couple of these tasks. It's not super good, but we got R squares of 0.7 or something like this. This is quite nice. We have power, we did a base analysis, we did factor analysis. We looked at the correlation in young and old. Oh, that means if there are correlations, the few we have there, it's the same as in the old ones. So there is some structure, it is just low. And yeah, the rank analysis. And also we have some range. So this seems to be all fine. So in some way you might say, oh, we had this thing with a driver license that you need to pass an eye test to get your driver license. So is that then all wrong? No, it's not. And this is just a small thing I like to mention here. So this is two type of, uh, of these acuity tests doctors use, whatever they are. You can see that there is some correlation. It's not actually super good, but it's not so bad. But the slide is a little bit misleading. So I talked, of course, when I talked about this to eye doctors, uh, <laughs> they found this bizarre to turn it this way. Um, not to say they got a little bit annoyed, uh, but I think there's a simple way to reconcile this. So this is what eye doctors measure, and they say from one to 10 or 20. So um, this means you have really bad vision. That includes people who are almost blind. And these basically, this is the main bulk here, that causes these correlations. But this is only 5% of the population. Here it is 95% of the data points, but in fact, it is only 5% of the population. So you're overweighting the disease population here. So if you just take this off and look at the well-sighted people, okay, there's still this line, but then if you compute a correlation here, and I asked the doctors to do this from this study and they did it, and it just turned out there's no correlation here too. So in the 95% of the normal, say 95, no one really knows. In these 95% of the well-sighted or corrected to well-sighted uh, population, there are no correlations. That means the tests are good to decide whether or not you get a driver license, but they are not good to tell about the vision of healthy people or almost healthy people. So these tests really pick up different things. So I think an important thing is, why, is there, why do we know about these things so little? And I think this is a big problem because we only publish significant results and a significant result is a group difference. That means all the people are worse. Yeah, of course, that's why that's, um, yeah, that's a publishing policy. But that basically makes us living under the impression that we have these huge, huge common factors simply because we never publish the null results. Same with the schizophrenia patients. I will show you a little a study a little bit later. It's the same. 
he only published significant results. That means, aha, uh -huh, group differences. That means, aha, uh -huh, the patients are either be better or worse than the normal population. But this is quite clear. They're never better, so they are always worse. So we live under the impression they are always impaired. But that's not true. In many, many tasks, the patients uh, uh, perform as well as the healthy controls. So it's really important that we publish good null results to avoid that we have this biased view and so on. Okay, part two. Okay, <clears throat> there are so many studies who link, for example, intelligent to vision or illusion strengths and things like this. So this is the main message what I had right now. I just give you a little bit more evidence that this is not something about healthy aging. This is a problem in general. And I think it's an important problem, but I leave this to you. So for example, here is a study they reported um, that an illusion like the Ebbinghaus illusion here, you see this looks smaller to you than this one, right? Or this looks better, bigger to you than this one. No. Mm -hmm. My. Okay, it's too small anyway. But uh, they correlated it with brain size. So here you have brain size and here you have illusion strength. And so what they did is they said, oh, let's look into the brain. Yeah, we find a neural correlate of this and we can predict how you perceive the world by simply looking at these illusions in some way. So we tested this, but we said, oh, then we should find correlations. So we did this. This looks bigger to you than this. We had this before that looks longer than this, right? But of course, they're always the same length and, and so on and so forth. We have other type of illusions, also the ones they used. And we saw, for example, at least that these spatial illusions here, yeah, here, small, this is EPFL actually. This is smaller than this one that looks larger. Of course, they're all the same size. So we thought these are spatial illusions. So if you have a strong illusion magnitude with one, you should have a strong illusion magnitude with another one because your brain size doesn't change. Yeah, your brain size is what your brain size is. And you should show strong uh, correlations. And we can appreciate this right away here. We just look at the last part. These are our illusions. This is test retest. So we did this twice and it's super good. So if a subject adjusts this, the illusion magnitude is the same. Yeah, for example, if you perceive this super large here, large difference, and you, if you do it twice, you always perceive it. So this is rather reliable. But you can see there is no correlations here at all between the other illusions. So if there had been a common factor like the, the brain size, we had, uh, would have expected this is all nicely correlated, should look something like this, but it does not. We just found one illusion, the Ebbinghaus and the Ponzo. By the way, exactly the two illusions these people used. So now I'm going to ask you a question. How likely is it that of, out of the plethora of a, whatever, thousand illusions, a research team picks just two? And these are the only two that are correlated. And that's the only one reported. It could happen, but the chance, I think, is extremely low for this. So I think the same story as before. We live under the impression that certain that there are common factors because we don't need the null report. Potentially they tested a lot of illusions and just picked the significant ones which they reported. You can say, oh, again, this cannot be true. There need to be factors. Yeah, there are factors. If we use different versions of these Ebbinghaus illusion, yeah, for example, different colors. And this is a completely stupid experiment. We would never do an experiment in our lab with these type of things. It's too badly controlled. But for this, it served the purpose. And you can see they're different here. We have soccer balls, you know, it's really stupid. Or we even move the, the inducers. Uh, we get beautiful correlations, even when we correct for multiple comparisons. So they are all significantly correlated if you have a version of the same illusion. But as soon as you go to a different illusion, things change. Okay, so we looked into the literature and the point is, Usually in literature, you never find too much consensus in our field, um, but here is huge consensus. No one else who did something like this found anything large. So whenever we do visual tests, we believe they measure something, they're representative for something, but when we look, they don't correlate, and that questions, of course, um, the validity of the representationality of these tests. Maybe these tests measure something interesting, but may, definitely not a common factor. So it might be that the problem is much, much more complex. Maybe that there are many, many factors and each of these tests picks up one of these factors. But there are other scenarios which are actually worst case scenarios where maybe these tests don't pick up anything useful. 
We don't know this. And we don't know actually how to analyze this. That's why we would be very interested if some data analysis people or mathematicians or whoever could help us to understand what's behind these low correlations. How do we do this time? Yeah. What, what time? Um, 15 more minutes. 13? One, three? Yeah, okay, good. Here's the last one, but once more, the story is the same. So if you got the story right now, it's fine. I just wanna show you how big the problem is. So this is a study with schizophrenia patients. So we had 121 patients, 74 controls. This is a, not a patient, it's a student in the lab. So she got the electrodes, she smiles, so she likes it. Um, and from her brain, actually this was called a resting state uh, paradigm. So this participant is not doing anything at all. The participant basically uh, just has five minutes in rest and we record from 64 channels, um, EG electrodes. Okay, that's a very standard thing, nothing new here. The only new thing is that for the very same participants, for our patients and controls, and the very same recordings, we analyzed them with different type of EEG techniques. Usually you just use one, and then you base your decisions on this. So we used everything we could find more or less. That's basically, you know, microstates, different frequency bands, if the brain um, cycles with a beta or an alpha or a theta rhythm, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really matter. And we compared patients with control. So this is basically the nose, these are the ears, this is the activity that's in the control. And you know, you don't need to be an EG expert to understand that the patients uh, have a completely different type of pattern than the controls. So here, this is the power of the theta band. Clearly, we find abnormal activity in the patients compared to controls. So it seems to be that this theta band tells us something about the disease. So better investigating what's going on in the theta band might tell us um, what's abnormal in the patient and maybe pave the way for, 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 for treatment and diagnosis. Okay, here's another one that's a yacht. This is a fractal thing. I'm not an expert in these things. You can see this is really qualitatively different. So the patients have activity high in the frontal areas and low in the back area. So it's another one. We found quite some interesting differences. So what we did next is, <clears throat> and in some way people just spend their life on now finding out what makes, where does this difference come from? What, why is this theta band important? And then usually the idea is, oh, there's something about the, um, the theta band is, for example, for um, a communication between brain areas and things like this. And people try to find out what's then the problem in the schizophrenia patient if it comes to the communication between brain areas. So what we did is <clears throat> from the 192, this was really a lot of work, 192 different EEG measures, all from the same patient and controls. We picked the ones that were significant. So showed a significant difference between the patient and controls. So they are good candidates to tell us something about the disease. And if they are representative for the disease, for schizophrenia, they should all correlate with each other. And you can guess what the message is, they do not. So these are 67 measures. They all tell you, uh-huh, here is a difference between the controls and the patient. So there are abnormal mechanisms, but they don't go together. That means either, again, the disease is highly heterogeneous, and then it would be quite interesting because then each of these tests picks up something interesting of the disease, or the tests are not that good. So I think an important message here is before we use tests, we should not only look if there's a significant difference between controls and, and, uh, and patients. I think what we need to do is we need to understand what these tests really measure and how representative they are. And that's at least to the extent I know, I'm not a doctor, I'm a mathematician actually by training. Um, to the extent, to, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever done this. So we need basically a better test theory in some way. And we need to understand how to evaluate tests, not only in terms of the effect size, how they can discriminate between patients and controls, but also how well they represent what's going on. And as I said, we have no idea how to do this. Yeah, that's what I said. And again, it's important to report not results. 
The last thing is, you know, I started this talk with a common factor driving. Uh, we looked into things like this. I just don't want to spend time on it. It's ex exactly the same. So people believe you can find out if someone is a good and a bad driver with a lot of tests. We looked into these tests. They don't correlate with each other. And that's no, <laughs> and this was, a, it was a nice study together with the TCS actually. It was real on-road on driving. So they had instructors and they evaluated the performance and it just turns out these tests simply don't tell about the same stuff. And this is no, as, I'm not in this field at all. Um, it is no, as far as I understand it, well acknowledged that these tests are not that representative for what we believe they do. Okay, last thing, just to confuse a little bit. Okay, let's go back to this. Very short. We have, there's a little bit, a couple of strange things. Again, this is our illusions, and we found one illusion. So we thought this might be a false positive. And we tested it again, but it seems to be there is something like this here. And it's surprising that actually this Ponzo illusion also correlates with, uh, with personality. But the, I, 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 I don't want to spend too much time on it. So we found that it particularly correlates with a certain type of personality. And, but it was, then what people, oh, sorry, I forgot the slide here. Ah. Then what people publish is say, illusions, there's a link between illusions and personality. That's not true. There's a link between the Ponzo illusion and cognitive, if I get it correctly, and cognitive disorganization. There is no link between other illusions and personality, and there's no link between personality and other aspects, uh, between all aspects of the contribution, only about this one. So there seem to be some strange, some strange uh, sporadic uh, correlations. There could be false positives that we don't know. But what I believe is actually that we are living in an ocean of no correlations. And then there are some mini factors like the ebbing horse, and there are some strange associations between them, like between the Ponzo and the and the personality, and what people then do is they publish this usually quite nice journals because it's surprising they a link between intelligence or personality and illusion. But that's not what they have found. They just have found between one illusion and one personality trait. And I think the reason for this, I think that's easy to explain is when we go back to the genetic code, we know that there's one million SMPs, this single nucleotide poly polymorphism, and that make, make us individual. And if you have a mutation, say, in one gene, and that basically codes for a protein, and if this protein plays a role, say, in the liver, and it plays a role for the visual system, then you will find a correlation. But it's about the protein and not about spatial vision. It has an underlying cause, and this cause evolves, and how should I say this? It evolves in a field where we usually don't have explanations for. That's the point. So in some way, maybe these tests or these low correlations just reflect the individual, uh, reflects the large individual we basically otherwise observe too. As I said, we don't look like each other, we don't perceive like each other. And this might simply come because there is extreme high variability. And that could explain why the tests are the way they are. Okay, I think this is, I can, Say it again. So there, I think we just said it. So, and as I said before, we created the illusions of common factors simply because we don't publish the results. So maybe the tests are not that good as we believe, and maybe we don't measure what we believe we are measuring. So my last part is about help. As I said, I, I think it's quite clear what the problem right now is. And I don't think that too many people paid attention to this. So here are the questions we are pursuing right now. And as I said, any type of help would be nice. Um, maybe these low correlations just come from that this is an artifact of linear analysis. Um, you know, with correlations or factor analysis, you cannot even detect the banana shape or something like this. Maybe it comes from this. Maybe they are, these low correlations just point to a bigger problem. Maybe everything is really so highly idiosyncratic, so specific that we are not able to um, uh, use these tests, and these tests would be useless. But it would be good, even, even they pick up something important, they are still useless because the complexity of the problem is much bigger. So in some way, we would need to have people who help us to determine complexity, to basically help us to see how big effect sizes need to be relative to the complexity of the problem. 
And another problem is, of course, that these tests are just snapshots. You know, a test is comes with a lot of parameters, and people are um, quite variable. So it might be that we're just having snapshots, and that these tests actually there is something deep. Maybe there is a common factor, and we just cannot see it simply because um, the way we have the test and the subjects are so variable. This is such a high dimensional space. We just basically got the wrong projection in some way, in a mathematical sense. We all don't need this. What we're doing right now and what we're planning to do is to come up with really good batteries with extremely good signal to noise ratio where we can really focus on the individual differences. And then, as I said, we need people to help us to understand how in high dimensional spaces we can classify data and compute complexity. Okay, I think that's it. And thank you for the attention. Let me say some words of closing for the seminar. Thank you so much, Michael, for having been with us today. Yeah. Thanks to all of you online and offline. Uh, we are looking forward to welcome you to our next event, hopefully. So next Monday, same time, same place, online and in INF 328, we will welcome Professor Mark Poli for the next Get to Know Your Neighbor seminar. And then the same day, we have the EPFLCS New Rips 2021 Mirror event. That's a new format. So uh, in case you still want to attend, there's a couple of seats free at the Swiss Tech Convention Center. Uh, have a look at the QR code uh, to get more information about the intent of the event. The next TS colloquia is going to take place on December 13th. We are looking forward to welcome Professor Susan Murphy. Uh, the title she, she proposed us for a talk was We Use Reinforcement Learning, but did it work? So looking forward to seeing you all soon again. Have a good day. Bye-bye.